Hello, my name is Mary. Welcome to Kelvin Gove Art Gallery and Museum. Here in the Ancient Egyptian Gallery, we have many artefacts that are 2,000 to 5,000 years old. And these artefacts provide important clues to help us understand how the ancient Egyptians lived and died. Modern day Egypt is a country in North Africa and people have been living there for thousands of years. There were once powerful kings called pharaohs that ruled over the land and built huge temples, pyramids and monuments that still form part of the landscape today. And despite the very hot and dry climate of Egypt, this ancient civilization thrived and invented many things to enhance their lives. They settled on the banks of the River Nile so that they could use the water for drinking and transport, find clay and stone for building, and farm animals and grow crops. The best time to grow was when the River Nile flooded every year, so the people invented a 365-day solar calendar. Farmers grew things like wheat, flax and papyrus so that they could make bread, medicine, fabric and writing materials. Papyrus was often used for writing on in ancient Egyptian times and is still available today. You can see and feel the rough texture of the woven fibres of the papyrus plant. People called scribes would record everyday information and wrote onto a variety of surfaces. They applied ink to papyrus paper and carved information onto walls of tombs, pyramids and stone slabs like this. They wrote in the ancient Egyptian alphabet called hieroglyphs. You can see that hieroglyphs look like symbols and pictures instead of letters and words. The ink that the scribes made was actually made in a similar way to makeup. This sparkly mineral is called galena, and it was ground up between these round and flat stones. It was ground into a powder and mixed with liquid to create coal eyeliner, and then safely stored in a little pot like this. Both men and women wore makeup, not only to look beautiful, but also to protect their eyes from the bright sun and to prevent infection. It worked even though this beautiful mineral contains lead, which we now know to be poisonous. This next artefact reveals that ancient Egyptians were experienced hunters and warriors. The triangular shape is an arrowhead which was part of a bone arrow. The stone, which is possibly flint or chert, would have been chipped to make tools and weapons like this, which were used to hunt animals for food. Sharp tools would also have been used to carve into stone to create beautiful sculptures of the gods that were worshipped. This sculpture is carved from granodiorite and resembles the goddess Sekhmet, who had the head of a lioness. The name Sekhmet means she who is powerful. She was believed to be the goddess of fire, war, destruction and plagues and her breath was thought to have created the deserts. Ancient Egyptians worshipped hundreds of gods and spent their lives aiming to please them so that they would be rewarded in death. They believed that when they died, their body and identity could be preserved, allowing their spirit to live on in the afterlife. It was believed to be even more wonderful than the life they knew. The process of preserving the body is called mummification and was an expensive ritual reserved for wealthy people like the pharaohs. All people were buried with belongings that they might need in the afterlife. A rich pharaoh might have many valuable things, but a poor person might only have a single pot or necklace and simply be buried under the sand. This form of burial has been extremely valuable in preserving ancient Egyptian culture. Archaeologists in the 19th and 20th century have been able to discover and analyse actual human remains, hieroglyphs and everyday objects that still have incredible detail. We have learned so much from these discoveries, but out of respect for the dead, we won't show any mummified bodies today. Let's imagine a wealthy pharaoh dies. Priests would take the body of the pharaoh to the place of purification, where they would chant prayers and perform sacred ceremonies to make sure the dead king was ready to move on to the afterlife. First, they washed the body with water from the River Nile, which was considered to be sacred. Next, the brain was removed through the nose using a hook. It was discarded as it was thought to be unimportant. The next step is to cut the left side of the body in order to remove the lungs, liver, stomach and intestines. Each organ is cleaned and placed into canopic jars, which are decorated with carved heads of the gods. It is important to leave the heart where it is, as the ancient Egyptians believed it was used to get into the afterlife. It was thought to be the centre of intelligence and emotion. The next step is to cover the body with a salt called natron and leave it for 40 days and 40 nights. And during this time, the salt absorbs all of the water in the body. 
Next, the body is washed again and wrapped in linen bandages with amulets for luck and protection between the layers. The mummy would be placed in a wooden coffin and then inside a stone sarcophagus. This stone sarcophagus belonged to the great chief steward, Paba Sa. You can see the carved shape of his body and face so that he is recognisable to the gods. If you look carefully, you can make out pictures of the gods and many hieroglyphs. Inscriptions on a sarcophagus usually give the person's name, their title and some prayers to protect them or help them enter the afterlife. The final step of mummification is to place the sarcophagus into a tomb or a pyramid with all personal belongings, as it was believed that the deceased would need them in the afterlife. When the first pharaohs ruled over Egypt 5,000 years ago, they had their real servants killed and buried with them to serve them in the afterlife. But later, shabti figures were taken instead. This little shabti is made of something called faience and looks like the figure of a mummy. Faience is a glazed ceramic material made from crushed quartz and other natural substances. The ancient Egyptian word for faience is jehenet, meaning dazzling or shining, and was used in amulets because it was believed to represent immortality and rebirth. Shabtis were the personification of the dead person and carried out any tasks that they were required to do. So now everything is in place, the process of mummification is complete and the door to the tomb is closed. The Egyptians believed that gods such as Anubis and Horus would travel with the mummy to the weighing of the heart ceremony. They believed that a person could only ascend to the afterlife if their heart was lighter than the feather of truth. Bad deeds weighed down the heart, so a light heart was proof that a person had done no bad deeds in their life. Hearts heavier than the feather would be devoured by Amit, who was believed to be a monster with the head of a crocodile, body of a lion and bottom of a hippo. If you hadn't been good enough to get into the afterlife, there was a cheat you could prepare. A winged scarab beetle amulet would be placed over your heart during the mummification process. It was believed that when the heart was weighed, the magic spell written on the scarab would keep the gods from finding out about any bad things you might have done. You can see that this winged scarab beetle is made of faeons, just like the shabti we looked at earlier. It's a beautiful material and has inspired me to make my very own ancient Egyptian artefact. Let's make a shabti using clay or salt dough. Salt dough is a bit like homemade clay. To make it you'll need two cups of flour, one cup of salt, one cup of water, a large bowl and spoon and also some tin foil because we will be baking the salt dough in the oven to harden it. For making patterns or marks I've chosen a blunt knife, a teaspoon, a pencil and a straw. Add your flour and salt to the bowl and gradually stir in the water. mixture is a bit too dry, add some more water and if it's too wet you can add a little bit more flour. To help the ingredients bind together you can add a tablespoon of cooking oil. After mixing your ingredients together you can use your hands to stretch, fold and knead the mixture until it becomes a dough. You want to do this for about five minutes. Divide the dough into two balls and keep half beside you for later. It's a good idea to cover it up because the air can dry out the salt dough. Lay a sheet of tin foil onto a flat surface and begin rolling your ball of dough into a sausage shape. We're going to work on top of the tin foil because it's easier to transfer it to the oven later. About a quarter of the way down, use your finger to gently press and roll to form a neck and head for the shabti. Use your fingers and hands to help create the body shape and press down very gently to make it slightly flatter. Give the head a little chin by using the curved end of your spoon to make a mark. You want to press very gently. Don't press hard enough to go straight through the dough. We want to just make a little mark. Bring back the ball of dough from earlier, tear off a piece, roll into a ball and then roll into a worm shape. 
we're going to make this into a headrace for our shabti. Gently use your pencil to make small dots around the edge of the head shape and add a tiny piece of water with your fingertip. This helps our pieces stick together. Place the long piece on top of the dots so it's even on both sides and press down gently. For the Shabti's arms, roll out another long piece and cut in half. We want the arms to cross over, so use your pencil to score a line where the arms would be. Imagine you're drawing a line from the shoulder to the elbow and then up to the hand. And do the same on the other side. It looks a bit like the letter W that crosses over in the middle. Use your fingertip to rub some water along the lines, then add on your arm pieces. Press down gently at the ends to form the hand shapes. Use a tiny piece of clay to make a triangular nose and stick it on with the flower water. To make the eyes, I press down gently with the end of a straw, but you could press down with a pencil or even add two tiny balls of clay. To make the mouth, you can gently press down with a blunt knife, a spatula or a spoon. Use different items to make marks and add some detail. I've made some patterns on the headrest using my knife, added some eyeliner, I also added some little lines on the hands to make fingers, and I've rolled up the bottom piece to give the impression of feet. After you have added all your details, make sure an adult helps you with this next part. Bake in the centre of an oven for 1-2 to two hours at 130 degrees Celsius. For air drying clay, there's no need to bake, just leave this overnight to harden. After it's baked, take it out of the oven and leave it to cool before painting. To get the look of faience, we're going to mix together some acrylic paints using white, yellow and blue to create turquoise and we're also going to add a little bit of glue as well to give the glazed look. When the turquoise paint has dried, use marker pens, pencils or paints to add any final details. Practice drawing hieroglyphs onto a piece of paper before adding them as a final touch to your shabti. I hope you've enjoyed this virtual visit of the Ancient Egyptian Gallery today. Remember to check our website and social media for digital resources to use in the classroom until you can visit the museums again. Music